Hello, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon to all of you. Today, I am going to welcome you session of the third day of Women Entrepreneurship Congress 2020. Although this is our last day, we will not go anywhere. We'll be back with the bank. But today I'm going to start my session with a power packed speakers, those who will be talking about women entrepreneurship in a world of change. They have built a good community and they have influenced the women entrepreneurial ecosystem in the world. So they can share their knowledge, they can share their views with you so that you can understand what is happening around the world. So uh, at first, I would like to invite my speakers in front of you. First of all, I would like to introduce them to you. We have with us Ms. Lina, founder and head of the board, female founders of the future. Next we have E. Catherine, Head of Research, Growth and Disrupt, SBR Bank. We have with us Anaida, co-founder and partner at Balkans Capital Financial Services. And we have Lina Hamdan, founder and CEO of Enablic Consulting. Welcome to our session. Okay, so at the beginning, I would like to uh, invite you to introduce yourself to our audience so that they get to know what is your activities in the women entrepreneur ecosystem. Starting with Liva. Yeah, thank you uh, for inviting uh, me to this uh, grant uh, um, project you're going on with so many awesome speakers from around the globe. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, my name is Liva. I'm the founder of Female Founders of the Future. I am from Denmark. And um, so calling here in, in early morning on a Saturday. We are uh, in Female Founders of the Future. We have, together with the Trade Council New York, running a program called Female Founders in Tech with, uh, with uh, founders uh, that are minimum one female founder in the tech team and scalable running to start and scale their own business. Then we are running, we have just launched a report together with uh, Danish partners in regards to return on diversity within entrepreneurship. And we are making a, a diversity commitment among investors in Denmark um, in regards to diversity and supporting more women in starting and scaling their own business as such in all what we do. So that would be in short uh, what we are doing right here. Yes, thank you so much, Eliva. Now I would like to invite Miss Ekaterina. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure uh, to speak at such a uh, fantastic event with such fantastic uh, women. Um, and thank you, Beauty, specifically for the invitation. So currently, I'm working in uh, Sberbank, which used to be a bank now turned in, in a big uh, IT giant. Um, in my present position, I focus more on uh, research and growth. So we do different research. Uh, uh, to find um, growth spots and then what we do we try to uh, somehow implement them in our present business to make it grow even better uh, before and um, and in my present position so i don't work uh, directly with women entrepreneurs but i support a lot of women entrepreneurship and different women initiatives just beyond the organization so i try to mentor them try to advise and somehow try to support them as much as I can. But before that, I used to work a lot uh, with women under different entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship initiatives in G20, in Global Entrepreneurship Network. And we were doing a lot of program like acceleration and uh, mentor programs and so on, again, to support and scale their businesses. So again, glad to be here. Thank you so much, Ekaterina. Now I would like to invite Ms. Aneda. 
Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for the invitation and for this amazing organization. Uh, I am Aneida. I'm from Albania, located in the Balkans. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Balkans Capital, a financial consulting company uh, based in Tirana. We have uh, recently also co-founded Balkans Finance Lab that offers educational pro programs uh, in financial literacy, starting from kids, uh, young people, uh, entrepreneurs as well are included. Uh, I'm also involved in the startup ecosystem in Albania. I'm the director of Startup Grind Tirana, a global startup community designed to educate, to inspire and connect entrepreneurs. I also organize Startup Weekends, the world's biggest education movement for entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm appointed as the senator of Albania in the World Business Angel Investment Forums, and, and the aim uh, for me being there is to help Albanian startups find investment uh, from uh, foreign investors. Uh, Thank you, I, so have, I have organized numerous events with the desire to, to, um, to help the development of the local entrepreneurial system in Albania and uh, women entrepreneurship is very close to my heart. So whenever I can, I uh, help girls uh, start their own business, be a mentor, advise and uh, support them even financially uh, through, through my business. Thank you so much, Aneda. Now I would like to invite Ms. Lina. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. And thank you, Beauty, for the amazing work that you put, you and your team put together to bring all these amazing women to share their experiences and also uh, get to know each other and learn from each other. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lina Hamdan, and I just want to start by introducing myself around 20 plus years ago when I was one of many thousands of women in the Middle East who is trying to find a way uh, and build a career path for herself and uh, to combine her passion of business and being self-sufficient and supporting other people throughout that career path. So uh, in 20 plus years, uh, I've been always working with people on a grassroots level, but also working on myself as well because it was a learning journey for me. Uh, I've been working with uh, a lot of uh, uh, programs with displaced people, specifically women on socioeconomic uh, support programs, uh, psychosocial programs, and then I uh, started to work with agencies and uh, uh, organizations like donors and UN to set up this, the ecosystem for the development work from a sustainable perspective, specifically economic, self-sufficient, sustainable um, system and then uh, also working with uh, governments and uh, other key players in the ecosystem to support women, youth and uh, vulnerable communities but also now empowered communities to uh, go through an entrepreneurial pathway. Today I'm uh, the founder of Enabling which is a consulting uh, agency that is uh, located in the United Arab Emirates but have a global scope of work where our name is a combination between enable and inclusive. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lina. Uh, we'll uh, learn a lot from you because we have something to discuss about on these issues. We have four speakers from four different countries. So definitely the women entrepreneurship from culture to culture, it varies. So I would like to know about how to evaluate the change uh, the, how to evaluate the influence of culture in women entrepreneurship and because of that how the women entrepreneurship actually affecting and which sector are affecting the most so my question first to is to Liva yeah so thank you for for this question it's uh, I've been considering uh, what is what how is uh, Scandinavian and Danish culture affecting uh, uh, are, are, are women in starting and scaling their own business. We have uh, uh, in Scandinavia as such as some of the most equal countries in the world in regards to gender equality, whereas uh, Denmark is slightly uh, lower than the rest of, uh, uh, of the Scandinavian countries. 
uh, on a 14th place where uh, the rest of the Scandinavian countries are one, two, three, four, five uh, on on the equality, gender equality um, um, uh, list. And of course that in many ways uh, poses grand opportunities for, for women to start and scale their own business. We also have a strong social security uh, system uh, and, uh, um, and maternity leave uh, um, uh, solutions that also infects uh, how we, we work. Uh, but one thing that does affect um, uh, what we've seen is, in Scandinavia is that we have a, a very strong governmental um, um, public sector in regards to education, health, care, etc., which means that a lot of the the businesses that are started by women, with because it's within education, care, etc., um, a lot of it they actually have to do business with government versus the private market, where there's a different uh, amount of money and a different type of business running in the private sector. So in, in some places, uh, women are, are competing on, on governmental, uh, uh, closing government deals. Um, and in, as such, also that affects some of the, the finance opportunities that are available within these industries. So, so both kind of culturally and, and uh, economically uh, has uh, different uh, perspectives there. So, yeah. So and they, I can dive into more of that as well, but I would like to hear some of the others before I uh, Thank you, Liva. I would time. like to know oh, from Ekaterina what is happening in Russia. Please unmute Hello. yourself. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry. So I think that uh, I've been thinking about that. And first, what I want to say, I, I tra traveled quite a bit so far. And um, I think when it generally comes to entrepreneurship, there is not too much difference between places. So it's like a special spirit, a special way of thinking that really um, uh, more or less um, similar in different cultures. But if we uh, speak about women, I think that generally in Russia, uh, something that would be a differentiator is that um, um, we are strong women. So we, our country passed through many, many uh, difficult events like for example, Second World War, and their women did not fight like on the battleground, but they were doing a lot, a lot like at the back office, let's say. And uh, so this feeling that of strength, I think it, it exists even now. And um, this is something that adds to our um, cultural leadership, I would say. But also what I want to say about about women entrepreneurship and women leadership, I think it's um, probably more responsible than men leadership. So for instance, it's an interesting statistics that women um, tend to return um, more credits than men. So when women take credit, they return more <laughs> compared to men and they are more dedicated to their um, uh, to their business, to their, like, whatever they are doing. And I think I also saw statistics that women, uh, women startups, they're more, uh, they survive more than uh, vice versa men. So they're more dedicated to, to their business, to their result. And I would say that probably women um, are better listeners. So they can somehow how sense and, uh, and grasp more information than men. And also what's interesting, uh, probably differentiate of our country that um, technology like math and technology-based technology, technology -based disciplines probably um, better uh, developed here like compared to European countries or maybe even to the US. So I think the, um, uh, it's about so not even 30, I think it's even more percent uh, women um, uh, inclusion in technology-based uh, business, vice versa, I think 15 or something percent in the U.S., so it's, it's much more. Um, well, uh, let's stop here and uh, let's see what um, other speakers will add. 
thank you so much for letting us know about the situation in Russia. Now I would like to know from Anaida what is happening in Albania. Yeah. Okay. So uh, basically, no matter where women live, they experience similar types of uh, role complexity and challenges especially when you combine the roles of working mother and wife and um, second no matter where women live they uh, have similar challenges and problems when they try to get started uh, a business or when they try to expand expand their businesses uh, if i divide it in um, into aspects in developed countries there are many aspects why women jump into entrepreneurship such as uh, self-fulfillment, creative skills, desire to independence, desire for wealth, power, social status, while in developing countries such as uh, my country, Albania, uh, many studies show that, that, that there are cases in which self-employed women are pushed by economic and social conditions such as uh, income, poverty, high rate of unemployment, uh, divorce problems, so they start their own business for fulfillment of basic needs or, or to support their, feel, uh, they, their family. Uh, in Albania and generally in, in the Balkans, there is uh, a lack of uh, entrepreneurial culture um, because uh, barriers to women entrepreneurship um, are impacted by cultural factors, which you include the lack of family support, access to informal networks, motherhood, uh, self-confidence and uh, the most important access to finance. Uh, women in the uh, Balkans lack the support of, of their families regarding their uh, entrepreneurial ventures as uh, entrepreneurship continues to be considered a man's job according to the traditional social and cultural norms. And the lack of support makes it difficult actually for uh, female entrepreneurship to start and, and grow. And there is a model that uh, kids are encouraged to follow. So go to school, you get the good grades, you find a stable job, possibly in the, in the government, in the public sector. Uh, you get married and have kids. And, and that's actually what is life uh, about uh, in, in the Balkans. And especially girls are raised in very safe environment where that is usually associated with avoidance of risk and failure. And uh, as you know, um, risk is the main factor of, of starting a business. And if you are not encouraged since you are a kid, you don't have this, this feeling to, 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 uh, <clears throat> to experience risk and to start, to start, to start a business. And uh, Albania, I think, is a good situation, but there, there are other countries where uh, financial barriers can be combined with legal and policy barriers and discrimination. Uh, for example, uh, inability of a married woman to travel without a male or barriers to, uh, to identification cards or legal constraint around signing the contracts on their own or accessing bank accounts or registration business. So there is a lot, a lot to be done uh, in regard to women entrepreneurship and to, to, to have a more favorable environment to start to start a business. So this is... Uh, Thank you I so think. much, Aneda. Now, Ms. Lena, can you please share something in this regard? Thank you very much. And uh, I would like just to echo all what my fellow colleagues and panelists uh, shared and just to give a more of a deep dive or a spotlight on the Middle East, North Africa region where we, I think, uh, have a combination of all the factors and the challenges that you just presented where uh, if we want to define the culture and its effect to entrepreneurship, it has many components where it has a lot to do in this part of the world with religion, uh, social tradition and belief system, policy, political situations and the legal uh, environment in the country and as well as and specifically in the recent years is the economic condition of the country. We're a region where we have, um, I would say many challenges, but I want to look at it from a strength based approach where these challenges also created some 
personal uh, traits in, in women specifically who are considered like maybe the most vulnerable sometimes. However, it also increased their resiliency, ability to cope and adapt, and that uh, the fact that they have to work hard to uh, support their families. So I just want to say that we have a combination where, of uh, women who are driven by their career and by their um, interest to, to grow professionally and have their own businesses and women who are forced by the circumstances to take a step forward because that's mainly the only option that she has to to sustain a good living to her family. We're in a region where we have uh, a lot of um, uh, displaced people, refugees, high intensity of refugees, and one of among the globally lower income uh, countries, if we're going to refer to some Middle East or North African uh, countries. Um, so a lot of these factors, as much as they were challenging, they created also an opportunity for women to grow. Um, we could share later on today some statistics as well. Uh, women uh, are the ones who are working in sectors that are uh, led by men. Uh, we're still very humble in the percentages of our representation as entrepreneurs and business owners. Uh, Africa has globally, uh, some countries, they're the highest women business owners in numbers. However, these are very humble, small, grassroots businesses, and the main sectors are still dominated by uh, male uh, entrepreneurs or business owners in, in this region. Thank you so much, Lena, for sharing such information and data of grassroots women entrepreneurs. So uh, as we are talking about the, the, the impact of the culture, the influence the culture is having for women entrepreneurs, but how, how do you evaluate or the, in, in the world of change, what is your opinion, what we can do to raise this, uh, to actually change this situation, and what are the opportunities we can build to so that the women entrepreneurs can build their own position in the society, starting with Liva. Yeah, well, thank you for, for passing on the word here. It's so inspiring to hear all the women uh, next to me. Uh, I, I feel humbled uh, by these awesome women sitting next to me. Um, yeah, so, so what is, even though we in Denmark live in this, uh, compared to the rest of the world, uh, equal country, there are still biases towards stereotypes in regards to understanding uh, what is a real entrepreneur being a man versus what is a good entrepreneur, could be anyone. And uh, so all of these biases and cultural differences that, that understanding of also what is a real leader versus what is a good leader. These are biases that affect, let's say, access to, to, to funding, access to uh, networks, etc. Even here in this uh, equal part of the world in regards to gender. And uh, so what to do about it? Well, We've created a report uh, on this topic you know, on all the numbers on, on, uh, in Denmark. And what we believe is that there's, of course, not only one solution, as it is part of culture, but that both startups themselves, uh, women starting their own businesses, <clears throat> can really make a big difference and actually take active choices in regards to, to gender balance in their own teams. because. Having more women start and scale their own business is both more women starting, more women starting and scaling, the existing starting and scaling. And then also on the other side, the, the male teams that start, that they uh, early on in their entrepreneurial journey include women in their uh, different levels of, of leadership as diversity simply pays off. Um, so, so what can we've made a whole report on what startups can do about it, and what investors can do about it, so that it it is not one, the woman only taking action, but also the whole ecosystem around uh, uh, entrepreneurship uh, taking action as well. And um, of course, it is the easy answer is making active choices to and. Uh, what it says in Entrepreneurship Book 101 is challenge your assumption. 
about the product and, and market you are entering into, but also the, the people you are hiring and the people you invest in, whether you invest time, money, energy, you hear awesome women here being mentors, yeah, in that, all of that. But I would like to give a link to some of the more the solutions that could go into this um, and to avoid these stereotype building uh, um, understanding of an entrepreneur being a man and being uh, in a certain way versus being um, the whatever person you are, whatever personality traits you, you carry with you. Because we, we need to solve a diverse pool of problems in the world, hence being solved by a diverse pool of people. So that cannot only be men, it has to be men and women from different okay. cultural backgrounds. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Liva. We should work together, men and women, it doesn't matter who you are. But now my question to you, Katharina, you work uh, from a bank and you work with the research team. So uh, you know that market is suffering. So how can women entrepreneurs can sustain themselves in this market in the world of change? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that Liva already mentioned some of very important points that uh, touch upon women entrepreneurship and generally women leadership. So um, what I think that and what, what challenges and um, well, let's put them as challenges that I see. So first, um, I think women need to communicate more their leadership and just themselves and uh, into the uh, into the business world. So again, looking at some uh, statistics, um, we see that um, men more speak about their success than women, and they go uh, generally they go faster on the career line. So for us, when when we have success, uh, I don't know. We usually, not usually, but in many times, we just do not, you know, announce that. For us, it's something normal just to do things well. We don't really put it, you know, in front. Vice versa, men, they, they tend to do it more often, and that impacts how we grow on the career line. So um, we really uh, need to focus on this and learn how to communicate our success um, uh, more. I also think that uh, women leadership is different from men leadership and in the world of change I think we are more equipped uh, to these changes because we can think uh, again it was a, uh, coming from the uh, one of the science reports that men usually think uh, in one Sorry, I believe the connection froze. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I would like to go to our next speaker, Anida. Can you please share something in this regard? Yeah. So uh, Diva and Lee Catherine uh, shared uh, some of uh, some of the insights I had about the topic, but I would like to add um, more about the technology because my industry is affected a lot. Um, uh, about technology and, and many other sectors where, where women work. So uh, if we don't do something now, we will find ourselves out, out of the market very soon. And uh, today the digital transformation provides uh, new uh, opportunities for the econ economic empowerment of women. And, and it can also contribute to great, uh, greater gender equality. We have internet, we have digital platforms, we have mobile phones, digital financial services that can offer many opportunities for everyone and uh, can help bridge this divide by giving women the possibility to earn additional income to increase their employment opportunities. Um, to, they give access to, to new markets. So um, if... Uh, uh, traditionally, it's very expensive to enter new markets. Technology nowadays gives us a great, uh, great opportunity, and we women should uh, should use it as much as we can. And um, we also need to size the opportunity to to foster great gender equality in the labor market. To put 
boost economic growth and to build a more inclusive digital world. And many industries nowadays are seeing the, the, the introduction of new te technologies that um, create new ways of how to serve, to serve the market uh, with the needs they have. And there is no industry that is uh, wholly immune from the impact of technology. Uh, so we should prepare uh, ourselves and our businesses for the future of work and um, we should catch every opportunities that technology brings. So um, I wanted to relate my, my insights about this with technology and every opportunity that it can bring to uh, women businesses. Thank you so much, Aneda. You emphasize a lot more on technology. We had talked about that, yes, technology is everything for the future. So I would like to know from Lena. Yes, you are working from Middle East countries and you know the real, realistic. So can you please share something? Thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, all the, even if we're from different parts of the world, there are a lot of common issues that we face everywhere as uh, as women, uh, as affected by our different cultures and uh, and living circumstances or uh, some other interactions. I would like to just handle this point from uh, a new angle or a different angle perspective. When we talk about these challenges and how we want to address them or find solutions, I think we need to look at the issue from an ecological perspective, the interaction between these women and their environment, and where are we investing the efforts most. So we need to map out what, what are the things that we're implementing and what we're doing to make things, um, you know, to ensure that there is uh, less bias, more integration, uh, more equality, equity, accessibility. So if I want to talk about it, there are like the uh, top-down and bottom-up approach. Um, I would say out of my experience and working with women and looking into a many, much of research papers that have been published on these things, most of the work is happening with women and on women. But if there is no work happened on all the other key players in the environment, you, we keep empowering women and then that will increase, unfortunately, her frustration level because she's very much empowered as a person. But how much the community and the country and the system is, in, is empowered to empower her or to give her accessibility or accommodation. And I just want to refer to one small example. We have a lot of policies that support women globally and on, in each country. However, how we can unpack these policies to be to accommodate for women and we don't need to challenge the culture we need to rebuild the narrative and uh, like I, I would look at uh, I know that pandemic is really stressful to everyone globally but I think one of the great opportunities and barriers that this pandemic really um, pull down is that women before, if they physically need to attend some, some conferences or training, in many cultures they have to be accompanied by men to get the approval, she can't leave the family, she has the struggle between her domestic role and professional role. And today, with everything uh, remotely, happened remotely, by force, sort of, but it's a great opportunity for her to be part and her voice to be heard. So uh, sometimes we need to rechange the narrative and the way and create the tools that will grant accessibility and accommodation for those women to be able to participate, you know, um, effectively participate and their voice heard. It's not only a bunch of policies, it's not about interventions and grassroots programs, it's a full inter action within the ecological uh, environment and uh, within the women and uh, their all uh, support systems. Thank you so much, Lena. Uh, you all have said almost everything that we need to accommodate in our entrepreneurial ecosystem. Although main things have been covered, still I want to know last few words or any suggestion, any recommendation do you have anything in this regard, starting with uh, Liva. Yeah, so, so echoing some of some of these amazing uh, thoughts, the structures around uh, the and the narrative. I really love that those points, and that is some of the points we have also in the report. We we notice is that uh, there is nothing wrong with women. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with men. Uh, yes, women needs to be in, in, in men and women needs to be encouraged to start and scale their own business because they can 
because they need to, because they can create value. Yes. When that said, um, we need to intentionally design for diversity in all entrepreneurial uh, 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 initiatives so that we do not unintentionally design for inequality or monocultures. We need to break that chain of, of repeating past cultural histories of entrepreneurship and leadership. We need to make it possible for everyone to be included and welcomed and feel safe in an entrepreneurial setting. That being said is that you cannot start making different, what study shows that when you make different questions for a, a male founder versus a female founder, these things need to change. We need to start asking potential questions to everyone to see that grand potential. And we need to not only ask women to step forward, but we need also to ask, uh, and especially investors to lean in to diversity whenever they invest. Is that part of a uh, um, uh, due diligence process? Is it part of a due diligence process to understand what's uh, going on in each company so that we start investing in companies where both men and women are collaborating together? And also that we need to understand that there is um, it, what we, we made this uh, this pilot project in Denmark and, and in regards to selection processes of, of 140 uh, startup uh, cases to 10 startup cases that should pitch in front of an investor. And what was interesting besides all the signs about uh, how bias play out in these selection processes, it was unintentionally, it was... Uh, less favorable for women because it was the unknown to those in the selection board that were not selected. The unknown market, the unknown product, the unknown technology. And if the selection boards are mainly um, men with historically working within male dominated industries, there's a lack of industry and market knowledge on, on, um, on the traditional uh, female uh, industries, and here I'm talking about education, care, um, medical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are also some of the biases where it unintentionally favors uh, uh, men uh, because it's it's known market, known technologies, etc. And so so really making selection process make that intentional design in whatever you do, so that you hack that cultural bias that that um, those unintentionally indicators that could favor a man in front of a woman because that you will leave great deals at the table if you keep on doing what you did last year so really start doing making active choices in all processes uh, in regards to whether you have an accelerator program, you have a mentor program, you have an incubator and um, an investment forum, whatever events you're holding, make sure that there are role models available for all. Make sure that there are, because gender matters in this sense in, in regards to role models, make sure that there are market representation in all selection boards, diverse uh, so, so some of these things can be done and can actually change um, the, the status quo rather fast. It doesn't have to take 100 years. Uh, it can take three years to change that, uh, which we've seen in Sweden. We've seen it in, in Canada. I've made great initiative. Holland, Australia, you know, these active choices to intentional design for diversity. That is what I see is needed. Thank you so much, Leva, for sharing such valuable information. Now, I'd like to know from Ekaterina, any last few words? Yes. Hi, again, I think I was disconnected before. Sorry for that. Yeah. So I, I, would, um, I would say that uh, what's really important is um, 
to communicate again, to communicate uh, women's success, to communicate um, their leadership, also to communicate their mistakes and learnings just to the world and to each other. So that should be taken uh, much more proactively and uh, that will impact how uh, not only each particular woman, but all women, um, uh, women community, women entrepreneurs, women business women, they will uh, go forward. What I also think is important is to come over the stereotype that business is played by men's, uh, it's a men's play, okay, because some women, I think that they, um, they are stopped by the thought that it's a man game business and it works uh, according to their rules. So I think that the situation, it, maybe it, it used to be like that some years ago, but now the situation is changing. It's more uh, di diversified world and women has uh, more footprint in it. And actually um, women leadership is a different leadership and uh, taking it from the position, from the strong point that we have from our responsibility, attentiveness and being good listeners and having uh, like being ambidextrous, being able to do many things simultaneously, like taking leadership from this point and bringing it to uh, the big play is something that would help to develop women entrepreneurship and women leadership too. Thank you so much, Ekaterina. Now, I would like to know from uh, Anaida, any last uh, words? Yes, so whenever I talk to, to girls and, and women that want to start their business, I, I just say don't, don't even think about men and women differences in business. Just do uh, what your passion is, uh, uh, solve the problem that community has with, with your businesses. Why think about about these gender differences? And although um, environment supports more men than women, uh, if you are able to do things and if you work hard, yes, you can succeed. And um, in what we can do and what other women do, our job starts at home with our daughters. So uh, I always encourage my, my daughter to, to speak up, uh, to say whatever she thinks, um, to, to start new things, to be creative, and to learn her that uh, failure is an important part of, of our life. And um, uh, if you don't have daughters at home, you have neighbors, you have relatives, so uh, to starting small, uh, encouraging girls uh, to take steps further, and, um, and just to know that failure is, is part of life. And, um, I also want to emphasize the value of, of technology and um, that we should embrace it as soon as we can. And the sooner uh, companies and businesses embrace the, the innovations that uh, are threatening the traditional business, uh, the sooner we can be disruptors in our own markets. And, um, uh, there are many things that we can do, but um, even if you are 20 or, or, or 50 or, or 60, just uh, get curious and, and skill up. Uh, the digital uh, skills uh, nowadays uh, give many opportunities even to start new careers at, at 50 or 60. Yeah? So uh, this uh, fourth revolution is, is just changing everything. and. Uh, uh, we just should embrace and, and gain all the opportunities that everything that technology has brought us. Yes. Thank you, Aneda. Any last words from Lina? Thank you very much. And just want to add a few points on, on this as a, um, not only a recommendation, but also based on uh, the dynamics that we're witnessing in the, in the sector of entrepreneurship and the gender and the social and the culture interaction. So I think one of the most important uh, things that we need to look at, data is now available. We have data. The question is, what's next? How we can use, analyze this data to come up to fill the gaps that are still shown in these data, data that it still present and exist. So uh, I think we need to go from now, from only presenting the situation to taking action. And this will happen bringing everyone on board on the same table, all the stakeholders, 
from the people of concern, which here we're talking about women and women entrepreneurs, to the highest decision makers and leaders to put together a plan and some tools and solutions in place. I think the other point I would like to refer it, to it is also, uh, it's, it's really interesting when you, we see the dynamics either within the institutions or in the economy or in the community. I think in many points, we as women, we react because we got sort of attacked or stressed by what we're facing. And I think we need to shift the way of reacting to responding. Because I think a lot of people who, sometimes it's, it's intentional, but many times because the other part doesn't know how does it feel and no one explained to them or educate them so then they they act based on what they think the situation is not how the people of concern explain the situation to them and try to make them uh, feel it another one is we're, we're getting into a, a a time where we're fighting the wrong battles where we're getting into an economy we're fighting being we, we want to thrive as women so instead of only proving that we're good leaders we're good business women we're good in our careers and professions we have also to fight another battle of being women and prove that we earn what we do and we're good at what we do the last thing i want just to highlight on is the importance of mindset shift we need to start to integrate this and from early stage in schools when we raise our children. A lot of things happening on um, the stereotypes of women. By the way, I just want to say something. I don't know. I think most of us know it, but no one speak about it. Many of when the companies say that they are very inclusive for women, we always hear about maternity leaves and how great they are. By the way, women who are entitled to this privilege across the world, they're very small portion of the total population of women. So women does not only need proper maternity leave, they need a lot more of things and access to opportunities and accommodations beyond only being tagged as, as mothers. Of course, it's a great role, but we need to look beyond it. Last thing is, um, this is, I don't know, some people agree, some do not agree. Entrepreneurship is not a status. It's not owning a business. It's a mindset shift and it's a lifestyle. So this is what we're saying and this is what we're trying to achieve by changing the narrative from a status quo to uh, a lifestyle and a way of thinking towards this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lena. I really enjoyed the speech that you have given. All of you have said uh, important lesson that we can learn from. Thank you so much for your time that you have joined us and you have shared your views with our audience. Thank you, guys. So the main key takeaways of our session is that they have emphasized all that if we want to adapt with the change in the world we need to bring men and women together in the same day will if we can do that we can actually help us to grow so definitely it's the main important thing and we need to have think that entrepreneurship is a lifestyle thank you so much hope to see you in our next session achieving sdg through innovation don't go anywhere come back again thank you